Tonight's reading is from Mark chapter 8, starting at verse 11, which is on page 1011. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for, such a, uh, for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we only have we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Hannah, wherever you are. Thank you for reading, and we have prayed, so let me get underway by asking you a question, which is, how did you become a Christian? You might have heard that question one or two times before. If you've been asked it by another believer, then you might well have responded with, with kind of listing gratefully the various means that God used to bring you into his kingdom. I went to a CU meeting aged 15 at school. I was dragged along to a church youth group by a friend. I grew up with Christian parents. They told me the gospel. Whatever it was, we might list those, those things that, through which we came to know Christ. How did you become a Christian? Or if you were asked the same question by a skeptical friend, how did you become a Christian? You might answer a bit more defensively. Well, I did grow up in a Christian home, but... Then as an adult, I looked at the eyewitness evidence for myself and I became convinced about it. Uh, we don't want to look like we've been brainwashed, so we list what we've done to look into the claims of Christ and how we've been convinced in our mind. How did you become a Christian? Well, this passage gives a slightly bigger answer. It's not that the other answers are wrong, it's just that they're too small. And this passage gives us a bigger answer. It doesn't deny the stepping stones that God may have used in our life. It doesn't deny the compelling eyewitness evidence for Jesus. But it does give us a bigger answer to the question, how did you become a Christian? And I hope as we think about it, 
we'll be both humbled and reassured. That's my hope. How did you become a Christian? This passage tells us, God miraculously opened my eyes and I saw Jesus. That's the answer. Here's the big point this evening. For someone to recognize Jesus, a miracle of sight is needed. For someone to recognize him, nothing less than a miracle of sight is needed. And we'll think about that big point using a pair of questions and answers. So here's the first pair. Question, why is a miracle needed? And the answer, verses 11 to 21, the spiritually privileged are still spiritually blind. The spiritually privileged are still spiritually blind. Now, by blindness in this passage, we're talking about a failure to recognize Jesus. You'll know that if you've been with us so far in Mark's Gospel. And in this passage, we get two groups of blind people. I don't know if you noticed that as Hannah read. The first group are the Pharisees, verses 11 to 13. And they come to Jesus to ask him a question, to inquire, and yet it's not really a humble inquiry, is it? Mark tells us, verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him, they asked, dot, dot, dot. Not to learn from him, not to work out whether he was the Christ, but to test, or as some translations have it, to trap him. To test or trap him. Like a maths teacher. In fact, we've got one in the congregation this evening. Like a maths teacher who might ask her pupils their times tables, knowing that they know their times tables perfectly well, but testing the children. Uh, working out their weaknesses, exposing where they don't really know their times tables. You see, the Pharisees have no doubt about themselves, but they are deeply cynical about Jesus, looking for a way to expose him as a fraud, testing him, trapping him. And you'll have met people like this, I'm sure. Uh, they say, well, I'm very open-minded, I'm agnostic, really. But once you get chatting, the agenda is pretty clear. You, you talk to them, you ask them about Jesus, you tell them how you've come to know Jesus, and actually it becomes clear they've no desire to change their mind. They feel absolutely sure of themselves, and they've got a deep and decided cynicism against Jesus. And when you open your mouth, you carry on talking, there's just no willingness to take the Bible seriously. They spout second-hand objections. Well, of course, archaeologists have proved this, haven't they? Microbiologists have proved this about evolution. And, of course, the gospel accounts are riddled with inconsistencies. Do you speak to those kinds of people occasionally? Well, imagine for a moment that Jesus is here on earth in 2018, and he has one of those people across the table from him in Costa Coffee. Here is a golden opportunity for Jesus to win a prize convert, to convince a kind of Richard Dawkins figure. What does Jesus do? He sighs, gets up, and walks out of the coffee shop. And the person is left alone. Verse 12, have a look. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. Jesus doesn't even credit their so-called inquiry with an answer. I take it he could have given them a sign quite easily, just pass your pack lunch, feeding miracle, take three, here we go. He could have talked them through his track record. Oh, you didn't hear about what I did with the leper. You didn't hear about the demon-possessed man, the Gerasenes region. I've walked on water quite recently. Here are some people you can ask. Jesus sees their motivation to test him. They're not interested in listening. This is a willful blindness a chosen blindness, a desired blindness. And as Jesus departs, well, he's passing judgment, isn't he? He's taking away their opportunity to learn. Here is Jesus relating to the willfully blind. 
And this may be a, one or, a warning to one or two here this evening. Uh, maybe you know you're, you're proudly holding Jesus at arm's length, not really taking him seriously at all. And I guess the warning is that you might get to your deathbed still unconvinced. And if you do that, it won't be Jesus' fault, as if he didn't manage to convince clever old you. It will be your fault, because clever old you was not actually willing to listen. The Pharisees are blind, willfully uh, blind. They desire to be blind. And in judgment, Jesus leaves them blind. And you might think, well, that's a proud thing for someone like you to say, Sam. You're a convinced Christian. And if it sounds a proud thing, then we need to look at the second group of people. Because the real shock in this passage is not the blindness of the Pharisees. We kind of expect that. It's the blindness of the disciples. They get into the boat with Jesus, and Jesus gives them a warning, verse 15. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. Yeast is remarkable for its extraordinary power of influence. Just a few grains of yeast, and the whole loaf is affected. And so Jesus says, watch out for the remarkably powerful influence of the Pharisees. Their cynicism, their hard-heartedness, their religious pride, a little bit of that could affect you powerfully. And watch out for the remarkably powerful influence of Herod, that man who was happy to listen but not happy to repent. A little bit of that attitude could affect you powerfully. It's a vital warning but it's ignored. Or rather, they just don't get it, verse 16. They start discussing their bread quantities. And in their failure to heed the warning, Jesus sees a very blind bunch of people, blind to spiritual realities of which he speaks. And if you've been following this series in Mark quite carefully... I hope those words of verses 17 and 18 make you shudder a bit. As Jesus says, do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? You'll know by now, I hope, that as God promised judgment through Isaiah, he spelled it out like this. Be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. And in Mark chapter 4, as that terrible judgment of deafness and blindness was mentioned and pronounced by Jesus, it was pronounced on people who were outside Jesus' kingdom and the disciples were inside. They were the privileged few to whom the secrets of the kingdom of, of heaven had been given and yet here in the boat, he says, do you still not see? Are your hearts hardened? Are you the blind people of whom Isaiah spoke? See, they'd enjoyed immense spiritual privileges, hadn't they? Months on the road with the Lord Jesus, seeing his miracles, hearing his uncut teaching, and yet they seem as blind as a bat. Why is a miracle of sight needed because the spiritually privileged in this passage are still spiritually blind. Any fans of charades here or charades if you're American? Charades, any fans? No. Oh, there are a few. Timid, but a fan. If you've ever played, you'll know how painful it is. The game is basically you have to act out certain characters or certain films, and your team has to guess who it is that you're acting out. And it's so painful when you on the opposing team can see who is being acted out and the target audience cannot see. And the people guessing don't have a clue, but you can see the person's actions right before your eyes and you can see very clearly that this is Luke Skywalker or Harry Potter or whoever it is. And it's like that with the disciples, isn't it? Verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the five thousands, thousand how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up 12 they replied when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand 
How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. You kind of want to say, I'll give you a clue, disciples. It begins with a m and it ends in a sire. They know the facts, don't they? But they don't see the Messiah before their eyes. They don't see that this is the Christ, the anointed one, the King, the Son of God, the rescuer. And yet it is quite sobering that they do see the facts, as it were. They see the miracles. If you've ever done any first contact or street evangelism, one of the things that is quite surprising is how many people know the textbook answers. Who is Jesus? Oh, I did religious studies at school. He's the son of God. But do they really know it? Do they know it as in believe it? Or is it just a kind of right answer that people can trot out? I can think of a young guy that I knew in a former life. He had been all the way through this Christian summer camp that we were involved with. He loved the camp. He continued as an assistant leader when he had to clean the toilets and so on. I'm sure he would have known the talk scheme better than most of the leaders. He knew the right answers in a Bible study. But sad to say, when we were last in touch with him, he wasn't a follower of Jesus. And I guess he would say something like this, I just don't see it. I don't see him the way that you see him. He knew the facts, and yet he didn't know the facts, or at least didn't know what those facts meant. He was blind, spiritually privileged. I don't know how many talks that guy would have heard. And yet he hadn't seen the reality of Jesus. So how did you become a Christian? Well, you may have enjoyed immense spiritual privileges. Access to the Bible in your own language, that is an immense privilege. Uh, many people around the world do not have that. Many people throughout history did not have that. You have it. Some of us have had Christian parents who have raised us with Jesus at the center of our home. Others have been to churches where the Bible is preached for some years or even decades. And yet with all those spiritual privileges, you could well have remained blind. I could well have remained blind. Blind to the reality of who Jesus is. And I hope that's a helpfully humbling reminder. If you're a follower of Jesus this evening, you're not because you've made good choices that other people haven't quite made yet. It's not because you looked at the facts carefully and were really convinced in your own highly rational mind. It's not ultimately because you were blessed with this person or that family or this course. Yes, God uses means. Of course he does. But the point is, he might not have done. He could well not have done. We could have been left out in the cold, left as blind as a spiritual bat, just fumbling around in the darkness, futile thinking, darkened hearts and minds. That, according to Romans 1, is what we all deserve. So why is a miracle needed? Because the spiritually privileged are still spiritually blind. But second Q&A, as it were, what kind of miracle is needed? And the answer is a recognition of the Messiah and his mission, verses 22 to 30. I find it immensely encouraging that see, having seen the blindness of the disciples, which looks so hopeless, straight away we get a miracle of sight. And as with the healing of the deaf man we saw last week, it seems so personal and tender. Just imagine verse 23 happening. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he'd spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? It's tender, it's personal. As mentioned last week, it's thought that saliva was a kind of Link, linked thing in some way to medical healing, at least in people's minds. And initially, there seems to have been some improvement. He does kind of see, doesn't he? The man was blind, 
And yet in verse 24, he looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. So that is good. A miracle has been done. And yet, if this man were alive today, the DVLA wouldn't quite be itching to give him his driving license back, would they? I do see the lorries, but they look a bit like giant shrubs or hedges. I see the granny on the zebra crossing. She looks a bit like a walking tree. And so Jesus goes again. Verse 25. Once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Notice the threefold description. Eyes opened, sight restored, he saw everything clearly. We cannot miss the point. And verse 26, Jesus sent him home, saying, don't go into the village. And the question for us is this, why is this miracle in two stages? I think it's the only one, in fact, I'm sure it's the only two-part miracle in the Gospels that we have recorded. I take it Jesus could have healed him with just one word or just one touch. He wasn't just having a bad day. But the point is this two-part miracle of physical sight, it's about to be followed by a two-part miracle of spiritual sight. And the physical miracle tips us off about that. So let's look at the miracle of spiritual sight. First of all, verse 29. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus has already asked the disciples what they think of him. And they've given answers which seem quite respectful. John the Baptist, Elijah, prophet. You sometimes hear it today, don't you? Religious teacher, leader. A fine example, sounds respectful, but actually those answers are blind. Peter gets it right. You are the Christ. Many of us are so familiar with these verses that it's hard for us to get the, the magnitude of what Peter's saying. He's saying, you're the one who will save us from all our enemies. You're the one who will rule over every single nation. You're the king who will restore the throne of David. You're the rescuer. So what has happened as Peter said that? Well, somewhere between verse 18 and 29, a miracle of sight has happened. Peter sees. It's a miracle. Let me suggest it's not very hard to work out who's blind and who sees today. Just ask a friend or a colleague the same question. Who do you think Jesus is? You could ask them. And if the answer is a fine teacher, a vital example, a spiritual leader, we've got so much to learn from him, you can be sure that person is blind. If the answer is not obvious, there's a, a long pause, a scratching of the head, oh, I'm not sure. That person is blind. But if the miracle has happened, if your friend sees, and you ask them, who do you think Jesus is, the answer will just flow obviously and automatically he's the Christ he's God's promised king he's the son of God he's the ruler he's the rescuer however they put it he's the Lord he's my Lord it's so obvious once you can see if you cannot yet see Jesus as the Christ let me say I'm genuinely delighted that you're here as a church we want to be welcoming to people of all faiths and no faith and yet preachers like me don't do you any great service if we pretend that you're basically along the right lines and if a few things click into place about minor details, you'll get there. What you need is what we all needed, which is a miracle. Spiritual cataracts need removing so that you can see. And if you know you need a miracle, cry out to God for that miracle this week. Come to Christianity Explored on a Thursday night. Ask God to show you who Jesus is. Now, for those of us who would say that we do see, praise God, we must remember this is a two-stage miracle. So when Peter sees, we're left thinking, well, is he half-seeing or totally seeing? And in the next few verses, we'll look at them next week we see that Peter is still half blind. Little sneak preview of next week, verse 31, Jesus explains he must die. 
must be killed and after three days rise again. And then verse 32, Jesus spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He says, don't be ridiculous, you're the Christ, you're not going to die. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Peter sees that Jesus is the Christ, but he does not yet see that this Christ must die for him. And maybe that's the reason that he's not given a preaching license. Verse 30, you're the Christ. And then verse 30, what an anticlimax. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. The preaching license is not yet given. Because even though the identity is right, you're the Christ, actually the Messiah's mission hasn't been recognized. I must die for you. So they were in no fit state to preach about him. A friend of ours became the vicar of a church. It was not a church with a Bible teaching history as I understand it. And the new vicar, our friend, wanted to assess the spiritual health of his congregation. And so during his first year, I think... He visited everyone in the church, at least sought to, and he asked them two questions, the second of which was this, why did Jesus die on the cross? His thinking, I understand it, was that if someone has not grasped the absolute centrality of Jesus' death, if someone has not grasped what happened as Jesus died on the cross facing our penalty so that we could be forgiven, Well, they have not understood the gospel. They don't know the good news about Jesus. I think our friend concluded that there were four Christians within his congregation. See, if you can see that Jesus is the Christ, if you have understood that he came to die for you, let me finish with one question. Will you thank God and praise him for the miracle of your spiritual sight. Yes, it is astonishing that the Son of God came to earth, and it's right at Christmas that we spend time rejoicing in that and remembering that. Yes, it is staggering that Christ, this majestic King, would die on a cross for us. But this passage reminds me, and I hope all of us, that but for God opening our eyes... Jesus and what he's done would have done us no good. He could have died and risen, and yet if we had remained blind to him, we would not have benefited. Will you thank God for the miracle of your spiritual sight? That miracle might have happened last year, and you can remember it clearly, It might have happened when you were so young that you cannot remember it. It really doesn't matter. But if you're seeing Jesus this evening, it's happened. The miracle of spiritual sight. And so when you read your Bible at home group this week or whenever your home group meets, and if you're talking together about Romans 8 and the privileges of being in Christ, it's good to remember miraculous sight has been granted to you if you're enjoying that conversation. When you read your Bible on your own tomorrow morning, maybe, and you find an old truth about Jesus that causes you great joy, miraculous sight has been granted to you. Will you thank God for it? And when you're chatting to an unbelieving friend, and maybe you're tempted to be quite proud and impatient with them, and their failure to see, it's good to remember that miraculous sight has been granted to you. God alone has granted that sight. He could well not have done, but in his great kindness he has. And he's the same God who can grant it for any of our friends. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you for sending your son. We praise you that he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And yet we confess without you opening our eyes, we'd be left spiritually blind, alienated from you, outside your people. And we praise you for the gift of sight.
We do praise you and thank you for the means that you've used for families, for camps, for churches, for friends. And yet we praise you for the thing that only you could have done, opening our eyes to see Jesus. Thank you for the miracle. Amen.